keep it simple, I'm the pastor for the pastors. That's my job. Mm -hmm. And part of my job is to <clears throat> help pastors to strive towards excellence in their, in their ministry and therefore the kind of churches they develop. And that's part of the passion why I want to talk about this morning. Let me go to our scripture reading. <coughs> Thank you, Rudolph. Randolph for reading. Thank you very much. The scripture reading is in Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. And there's a little phrase in there where Mark records Jesus' temptations. This phrase is not in any of the other Gospels. Okay? It says that he was into the wilderness, driven by the Spirit, and he was there 40 days. And then it says he was with the wild animals, or beasts, as the word says. And the angels ministered to him. Now, in the other Gospels talk about the angels, but they don't mention the beasts. Jesus is with the beasts, the wild animals. <clears throat> and commentators will ask, why does Mark put that phrase in and no other Gospel does? What is Mark trying to do? What is he saying to us? Now, there are th the commentators will tell you there's three possibilities. One, it's geography. It's just a matter of geography. It's like, where was he tempted? In the wilderness. Yeah, well, where in the wilderness? Out where the wild animals are. That's where he was. When we worked in Egypt, the, the great river Nile, um, can we just turn this light off so I don't have to look at it? Please. Or are you using it for something? Yes. That's great. Just, is it possible to turn it off? Great. Um, where the river Nile runs, there's green vegetation. Then suddenly, and I mean it's as stark as this row of chairs, green uh, desert. It's just it's stark. You can stand one foot on green and one foot on desert, and it's just desert, and desert for miles. But the wild animals aren't here. They are further out in the wilderness, in the desert, and you go out to where the wild creatures are. And so Mark would be saying, where was Jesus tempted? Out where the wild animals are. That's the geography. Okay? So that's one explanation. Second explanation is it's theological. Mark is saying, Jesus was not tempted in the Garden of Eden, where everything is nice and the animals are calm and, and, very, and very sweet and you can pat all the lions and tigers. He was tempted out there where everything is broken. He had it where it's tough and rough. That's where he was tempted. You guys have it easy compared to what he had. That's what the theological. And that's the second. And you don't have to choose between. There can be all of those. There can be both of those. There's a third one, though. The third one is the one I like. The third one is that Mark is going to trace a theme through his gospel. And Mark sees Jesus' passion. And Jesus' passion is going to where broken things are and bringing angels into fellowship with them. And I want you to think about this. Jesus always goes where wild people are and brings them into the company of angels. It's a very beautiful thing when you think about it. And I'm going to show you this thing in, in the first seven stories. There are seven stories in Mark chapter 1 and 2, which finish in Mark chapter 3, verse 6. Mark chapter 3, verse 6 says that the Pharisees and the Herodians decided to get together to kill Jesus. So there, it, this story of Jesus drives up to this high point where they decide he's dead. We're going to kill him. Now let me run through the stories, and I want you to see the theme that runs through. First story is when Jesus is knocked at the one. When Jesus goes to the synagogue. And on the synagogue, at the synagogue, if, if Jesus came to you visit your church, I wonder how it would be remembered in a year's time. There would probably in your church, there'd probably be a picture on the wall of Jesus and the pastor. Or Jesus and the elders sitting together, and arms around each other saying, Here's, this is, Jesus came to see us. Okay? Or we'd record his sermon. We'd have it nicely recorded and we'd play it over and over and over. Mark says, when he records Jesus' first Sabbath in the synagogue, he records that there was a demon possessed man there and Jesus kicked the demon out. Full stop. That's it. Jesus is meeting a lost person and bringing that person into the fellowship of angels. <clears throat> I'm going to run through this very quickly. The second story in Mark chapter 1, is when Jesus is walking along the road and a group of lepers come and there's a leper that comes to Jesus. Where do lepers live? They don't live in the housing estate. They don't live with people. They live out 
where the wild things live. And then this guy comes up to Jesus, Jesus, are you willing to heal me? And Jesus says, boy, I'm not willing to heal you. It says that Jesus goes up and puts his hands on him and, and heals him. Again, what does Jesus do? And then tells him, go home, go home, go to the temple and put it right and go back to your family. Jesus is in the business of meeting lost people who live, have to live out where it's wild and bringing them into fellowship with angels. Same thing. Next story, chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus is in a house, and it's the story of, the, of when he's preaching and the guy comes down to the river. Remember the story? Okay? He comes down. Now let's think about the story. If, if you're in your house, no matter how it's built, whether it's, even if it's just palm leaves, and I said we saw houses in Egypt that just had palm leaves, some had bricks on top of them, or, or wood, and you've got to lift it up to make the hole. However this guy comes down, what would be the first thing you would say? Think about it. Just think about it. Huh? You'd say, what are you doing? Or, what do you want? You know, what's Jesus' first thing he says to the guy? He goes immediately, he says, you're forgiven. That's the first thing he says to this man. You are forgiven. The guy has not asked for forgiveness. But Jesus is preaching the gospel. And Jesus is so passionate about this guy who the Pharisees would consider lost. And they get very upset when Jesus forgives him. They would say, How is Jesus? He shouldn't be forgiven. God only can do that. He's a bad guy. Look at him. He's crippled. But Jesus' passion is lost people. And his passion is to get the grace of God across to them. So the first thing he says to the guy is, You are forgiven. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. Nothing else comes first. Lost person, you forget. Next story, after that one, is Jesus walking beside the lake. And he says he's walking beside the lake, and he sees Matthew Levi. Whoa, Levi. Do you know what that means? This kid, this, this guy, Matthew Levi, is the son of a priest. He is a preacher's kid who's gone wild. He's not just gone wild, he's gone way out there. He's like with the mafia. He's bad. He's a tax collector. And Jesus is walking beside the water and he sees Matthew Levi sitting at his, at his booth. So the guy isn't sitting there going, I'm, I'm reading my Bible right at the moment, Jesus. The guy is doing the business of ripping up his own people. And what does Jesus say? Jesus looks at him and says, Matthew, would you like to come follow me? That's his passion. Reaching lost people where they are, he goes to where lost people are, where the wild animals are, and brings them into the company of angels. That's his passion. So Matthew, come follow me. And then the next, the next part of that story is Matthew, when he goes to Matthew's house. We touched on it a bit this morning in Sabbath school. In Matthew's house, guess who's there? It's not the same. It's the prostitutes. It's the sinners, the tax collectors. And by the way, they would not have been singing Handel's Messiah. They would have been rocking. They would have been doing the wild stuff, whatever they did in those days. And Jesus is there. And again, in our Sunday school lesson, we talked about the challenge of staying away from the world. Jesus is so passionate about wild people. And he goes there. He goes there. And when the Pharisees say to him, uh, in, in the next part of that story, Jesus, why? They said to his disciples, why is he mixing with bad, bad people? Jesus gives this amazing answer. He says, because I'm a doctor. Duh. No doctor rings you up and says, are you well? I'm coming to see you today. No doctor does that. Neither do you ring a doctor and say, doctor, I am feeling top of the world today. Come and see me. No, no, no. Jesus, I'm a doctor with a passion for sick people. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm with these bad people, because I'm passionate about lost people. The next two stories, the last two stories, are the stories of Jesus going through the cornfield and then the story of Jesus in the synagogue on the Sabbath day with the man with the withered hand. Both of these stories tell you that Jesus says to you, to us, people are more important than Sabbath. Did you get that? People are more important than Sabbath or your Sabbath traditions. The Jewish people had Sabbath so wrapped up, and then you couldn't walk a certain distance. You couldn't pick up some things. 
There are all sorts of things you have to do if you want to be a good Sabbath keeper. And Jesus says, my guys are hungry. And they're rubbing a bit of corn in their hand. Sabbath was made for them. Not them for the Sabbath. But sometimes we don't get that. Sometimes in our traditions as Adventists, we make Sabbath so hard. We give our young people heavy burdens and don't help them. You know, I, I missed a part of the story just before Jesus meets the leper. After the synagogue where he cast the demon out, it says Jesus went to, to the house of Peter. And Peter's mother-in-law was ill. Remember the story? And it says he healed the hair of the fever and she got up and served him. Then it says, and think about this, it says at sunset, when the sun had set, all the people came to Jesus for healing. Why did they wait till sunset? Why did they wait till sunset? Because you're not allowed to come to Jesus on Sabbath. You think about that. That is horrific. Here is the church. They just seen Jesus cast a demon out on us in the Sabbath morning service. And now the whole afternoon, no one can go to Jesus. Because the church had taught, you don't go to God for healing on Sabbath. What a horrendous teaching. What a lie about what Sabbath is about. This is the day when God wants to hug you and give you all the kisses he can because he wants you to know, I love you tremendously. I'm passionate about you. And if you're a lost person, I am extremely passionate about you because my business is going to where lost people are and bringing them to fellowship with angels. That final story in Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, is Jesus in the synagogue on Sabbath there's a man with a withered hand. If you read between the lines and read the side of Jesus, Jesus is being set up. The Pharisees in there are saying, let's, let's let him break the Sabbath. And it says that Jesus stands up and it says, read, read the story. It says he looked about them with anger. And the word he used is wrath. It's the same word that we use in Revelation 14 when we talk about the wrath of God. Here is Jesus in a church, in a synagogue, saying, Boy, I'm angry with you, Lord. You hard hearted people that think your Sabbath is more important than this person with the withered hand. You don't get it. It's a very powerful, very powerful passage. Jesus is so passionate about people that that comes first. As I said, we lived the last few years in Egypt, <clears throat> and I watched. Islam. I watched Islam and their religion. Do you know that in Islam, if you're a really good person, you'd be saved. If you read your Koran during the week of um, Ramadan, if you read your whole Koran during the week of Ramadan, all your sins are forgiven. I wish it was that easy. If, and, and, and when they give, see, the Muslims have this scales idea. And the more you put good stuff onto this stuff, onto this way it down, the more you're likely to be saved. So it's a, it's a way enough thing. And what God does is He says, yeah, yeah, you're good enough, you can come. So God is interested in good people. You guys who don't, who don't who do the bad stuff, God says, I don't care about you at all. Not until you put your life right, start reading the Koran, start doing paying arms, start doing the good stuff, then I'm interested in you. That is the total reverse of Adventism. The total reverse. Adventism is the teaching that there is a God who's desperate to reach you. Mm -hmm. Loves you passionately. Yeah. And I don't care what you are. Mm -hmm. You can be a prostitute, you can be a tax collector. Ta tax collector. I will come for you Amen. because you are important. Amen. That's what Adventism is. Mm -hmm. And I, we need to think about this in everything we do. Jesus' leading value, his leading passion was lost people. They come first, he says, above everything else. They come above dress. They come above food. Let me give you an example. Because, you know, we talked this morning a little bit about being impartial. I wanted to talk about Asta. I love Asta. Because, you know, Asta, or whenever I see Asta, it says A-S-D-A. -A. I love that. A-S-D-A. -A. It should be an Adventist company, but never mind. Um, let, me, let me give you an example. I'll give you two examples. Fred. Fred is walking along the road. He has a, a knee. He feels hungry. Okay? So he's walking along the road. 
He's who? He's his Esther. Oh, I'll try. He goes up to the door. The door opens without him having to push in. He doesn't have to pull it. He doesn't have to look at how he's dressed. He's got his old work clothes on. He's got his jeans and a t-shirt on. He goes in. The door's open. He goes into the shop. And a lady or a gentleman says to him, uh, uh, he says, oh, look at the sandwiches. Yeah, come this way. He takes him down to row number eight. What kind of sandwich do you want? Uh, I'm vegan. Okay, we've got a vegan section over here. And Fred Martin, as to his work it out, no partiality. No partiality. He doesn't look at the man in the suit and tie and say, you're welcome in our shop. He looks at the man in the suit and tie and the man who's in plain old jeans, torn, whatever, or the girl in the miniskirt so short that it's embarrassing. They look at them and say, we treat you equally. We are impartial. I wish that those churches would learn that. How come Asda's ahead of us? Take the opposite. Mary. Mary has been to a party Friday night. She was so drunk, she has no idea how she got home. And she wakes up that morning feeling dreadful. It's a Saturday morning. She wakes up feeling suicidal. And she decides to go for a walk. Then she hasn't done her hair, she hasn't done anything. She just chucks on some whatever's handy. And she goes down the road just thinking, how do I take my life? And she stops outside and has just chair. Now listen to the possibilities that could happen. First of all, she looks at the sun, it says 10 o'clock. She looks at her watch, it's 5 past 10, she says, I'll go in. She goes up to the door, and it's locked. No one's arrived yet. Everyone don't care about being on time. That could happen to her. It's happened to me. I've been to a church for us to preach. 15 minutes after I got there, after I was supposed to start Sabbath school, somebody turns up. What is that? We don't care about lost people. Another thing could happen. She goes up to the door, and I did this at one of our churches. I opened the door, and he knows this big sign. Guess what it said? Guess what it said? It didn't say walk. It said wipe your feet. That's what it said. And I'm going, and I'm opening this door thinking, okay, I'm a four-year-old, or three-year-old, or eight-year-old. I need to wipe my feet before I come in this place. There wasn't a welcome. You won't find that in that stuff. How come Asta's worked it out? Or Mary goes in there. Okay, she, maybe that doesn't happen. She goes in. <coughs> she finds a seat. She's sitting down. And somebody comes up and says, You can't sit there. This is our seat. Oh, I'm sorry. So Mary gets up and goes to that seat. And then she's sitting there. Uh, she doesn't know what goes on in this place. The Sabbath school teacher gets up and says, Did you study your lesson this week? And Mary goes, What lesson? I didn't know there was a lesson. You know, well, we, we can do stuff to people, but drive them away. That's what we're doing. Just get rid of them. Asta doesn't do that. Or, we'll, or the pastor will stand up and say, okay, I want you to turn to Obadiah chapter 3. And Mary, Mary's going, over what? And I want you to read it in the King James Version so you don't understand. <laughs> what are we doing? Even Asda knows he's talking simple English so that anyone can understand. Hey, I, I don't want to overknock the church. But I'm just, I want to make the illustration. Jesus' passion for lost people determines everything that happens. Lost people feel comfortable in his presence. Lost people should feel comfortable in our churches. That should happen. As the, the world has got it figured out, anybody can come to our shop. Anyone. And they do it to get some money. We are doing it for a golden crown. Amen. That's the next thing. I'm, I am very happy this morning to see my brother here with no tie. Excellent. <laughs> because I want a secular person to be able to turn up in church and say, you know what, I didn't have to wear a tie. And do you know that, that the trends that we read nowadays, even in the business professional world, ties tend to be on the way out. But sometimes we say, no, you've got to dress this way. Or you have to say, um, you know, we need to think about how we, how we relate to people so we make them feel welcome. Because Jesus' passion for lost people comes before everything else. It comes before the churches of his day. Their hand washing, their what you're allowed to do on Sabbath in the cornfield, what you're allowed to do in church. Jesus says, no, no, lost people come first. Above everything else, above all, lost people matter to God.
And we need to think about that in the, as a value, our leading. Sometimes I say to churches and to individuals, what's your leading value? What's the most important thing in your life? And most actors have not thought about that. Or they'll go, hmm, I hadn't thought about that really. But I guess if you really push me, I guess it would be, and they name the value. Well, let, let me give you a couple of stories. I want to make sure my time's all right. What is it? I can't read your watch. <laughs> okay, I've got a few minutes. You can't read it out. I got a few minutes. This happened to a pastor friend of mine. In fact, he was a worker in the division. He was on holiday in a particular country. I won't tell you which country. He and his wife were on holiday. It was a tropical kind of country. And on the Friday, they were looking for an Adventist church to go to church on Saturday. Okay? So they're looking around. They can't find an Adventist church. So they said, oh, it's all right. Saturday morning, we'll take our Sabbath school lesson, look at our Bible. We'll go for a walk, find a nice, quiet beach or something to sit by. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the Sabbath there. So they're now dressed casually. No tie, slacks, t-shirt, you know, they're out. They look down the road and they see some people, nicely dressed, by the end of the arm, they go, got to be Adventist. So they follow them. Sure enough, down a couple of streets, and there's a lovely Adventist church. Now this pastor and his wife say, great, we can go to church. Now they're stepping up the steps to the door when the deacon opens the door and says, where are you going? <laughs> no welcome, where are you going? And the pastor says, we would like to come to church. He says, not dressed like this, you're not coming in this church. That was the greeting, and he told me that. Some of you might know Pastor Paul Quinn. This is what happened to him. Wow, this is an his church. While he, the deacon is talking in this, another deacon steps out and says, Wait a minute, brother, this is Pastor Clean. I have seen him on training programs from the division. You're Pastor Clean, aren't you? Yes, this is our Pastor Clean. Guess what the other deacon says? You're still not coming to our church without the time. It happens, people. I have a pastor friend in the States whose son grew up in the home and then when he went off to uni, left church, left home, left church. And he told me the story, he said, Lou, I had to travel one day, he was working in the conference office at that time. I had to travel to this particular town, and I knew my son was in that town, so I emailed my son and said, son, I'm going to be at church on Saturday, I would love to see you, is it possible I'm going to be? So the pastor said, come, he went to church, during Sabbath school, he keeps looking around to see if, see if the son is coming, the son doesn't come. Divine service. He is now sitting up the front. And he said, this church was designed in such a way that there were windows on both sides and you could see the car park. Okay? So he's sitting up front and, he, and, and they're doing the announcements and stuff and he sees a car pull in and his son gets out of the car. And his heart is going, wow, my son's come. I want to see my boy. There's a young lady with him. And so that's great. He sees them walk around, then they disappear from sight as they go around to the entrance of the church. And after a little while, he sees them walking back out, getting in the car, and driving off. And he wonders, what is happening? At the end of the service, he gets up, and he's very quickly down there, to the door, before anybody asks to get him. He goes up to the deacon. I'm sorry, I'm picking on you as a deacon. He goes, did you see the young couple come in? The young man, and there was a young lady with him. Deacon says, yes, and did you see that entry of their skirt? I told her, you do not come to church dressed like this. You go home and get dressed properly before you come to church. That pastor friend of mine said, no, I couldn't cry. This was my son. Probably for the first time in years, coming to church. And the deacon tells him to go home. That deacon does not, well, that deacon has a value. What are his values? Good dress. Is that a good value? Yes, it's a good value. But it's in the wrong order. There is a higher value. Jesus said, you tithe me from Annas and leave the greater things undone. Mercy and justice. We're leaving, we can leave it undone. And the deacon who says to the pastor, not come and dress like that, has the same value. Dress is the highest value. It is higher than people. So he says to this man, you're still not coming into my church just like this. You see, he's got a good value, but he's trampling mercy and justice and kindness. And that's what we mustn't do. We've got to think through our values as an individual. 
lost people matter. But Jesus is passionate about them. So passionate that the church kills him for it. They kill him. That Sabbath, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, it says, verse 6 says, the Pharisees got together with Herodians to plan how to kill him. Because they don't like his values. Guys, we've got to think about the same thing. As individuals, you have to think, what's my top passion? Is my top passion being holy? Is that why I don't mix the prostitutes? Is my top passion to get me to heaven instead of getting her to heaven? Your, pattern, your values are mixed up. Jesus' top passion, top passion is lost people. And we as churches need to think, you know, you, you're about to get your church rebuilt, remade, looking beautiful, I'm sure. You've got to think about the way you do church. Is it a place where your young people can say, I love the way you do Sabbath school. I love the professionalism of our singing. I love everything. I am desperate to bring my school friends to church. I'll guarantee that if we survey our young people and ask them, is church the kind of place you would bring your friends to? Most of them would say, no way. In fact, there are some church services I've been to where there should have been a sign at the door saying, Advent is only. Because we're going to do our thing in here today. We're going to have our arguments in here. And lost people would not understand and be turned away. Instead, we need to think about how we do church. How our passion, our, our excellence in how we do church. So that when a lost person comes, they go, I like this church. I want to come back again. Because in the end, that's the business. We're in the business of saving people for the kingdom of heaven. I also believe that if our passion is to save people, we will save ourselves. But if our passion is saving me, making me the holy person, and let's leave the bad people out, I believe we are lost. We are going to lose ourselves. Let me finish with the story. You know what a house angel is. This is such an amazing story that I, I, I'm really shocked that everybody doesn't know the story. But let me share it with you. Bob is a hell's angel. Hell's angels are known for their... They're not known for being nasty. They, they deal in drugs, they deal in prostitute, prostitution, all sorts of stuff like that. Anyway, Bob is a big guy with a leather jacket, big motorbike, and one day he tears his leather jacket. And he goes into this shop that repairs clothes, and he goes up, and behind the counter, there's a stunningly beautiful young lady. And he forgets about his jacket, and he just says, oh, you are beautiful. You're so stunning. It's so funny. It talks his mind. And she goes, excuse me? I don't even know you. What are you here for? And then Bob remembers the jacket. So he says, look, I, I tore my jacket. Can you fix it? And she says, yeah, we can fix that. Give you two days and come back. So Bob leaves his jacket and he goes home. But he cannot get the girl out of his mind. The guy has fallen in love. Just flipped on her, just like that. So when he comes back to her, excuse me, I wasn't going to use you because it's amazing. Okay. Uh, he goes up to the other lady and says, Look, I need to apologize for the way I spoke the last time. That was out of order. Um, but you really are beautiful. And um, um, could, could I take you out to lunch? And she, the approach is much better, and she goes, and she's not a Christian, you are. She's not a Christian, she says, well, all right. Anyway, they fix the jacket, and that's all sorted. And she starts to go out with Bob. Let's call her Mary. Mary and Bob are going out together, and after a while, please remember they're secular people, after a while she has become a house angel, and she's living with him. Okay? One night, it's a Friday night, they are lying in bed. And Mary says to Bob, Bob, I'd like to go to church tomorrow. And Bob about jumps out of his skin, church, I don't do church. You will never get me in church. Bunch of hypocrites, I have nothing to do with church. And Mary says, uh, but I would like to go to church. I don't know why, Bob, but something inside me just tells me to go to church. And Bob says, never, I'm not taking you to church. And Mary says, Bob, you know, I feel so strongly about this that if you don't take me to church, I think we ought to split. Mm -hmm. Now, Bob is so in love with this girl, and he says, okay, I'll take you to church. 
but only once. I'll take it in. But he really says, by the way, you made a mistake. You're not going to church tomorrow because church tomorrow is Saturday. Church is good on Sunday. And Mary says, there has to be a church on Saturday. Because when I was a little girl, there was a couple lived next to us. They were the sweetest, loveliest people I know. What a good animal. Lovely people, and they went to church on Saturday. So Mary says, there has to be a church. So Bob gets the phone book, and he starts, goes to, he goes to church, and he starts at A, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. He says, Mary, this is a waste of time. Everybody knows, church is Sunday, Sunday. So he says, keep on, Sunday. It takes a while to get down to the S, okay? Finally, he gets down to Saturday. He says, what church is that? He goes, this is Saturday Adventist. I've never heard of this church. She says, I don't know, I, I don't need it, but we're going there tomorrow. Okay, so next, that Sabbath morning, it says 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, that Bob and Mary come up on the motorbike, leather jacket, Carl's angel is sitting on the back, he's afraid of no one, walks right up to the front, sits on the front row, ready to the Sabbath school. Pastor stands up. He says, okay, we have today our Sabbath school lesson is the names of the topic. And Bob says, I'm not interested in that topic. I want to know if there's a good God, why evil? It's just straight out. Bob's afraid of no one. So the pastor, in telling him he's the one who wrote the story, says on the Friday night, when he was doing the final preparation for the lesson, it's like the Spirit of God said to him, Pastor, tomorrow you better be ready to answer the question, if there's a good God, why is there evil? So he says to the church, just do you mind today if we don't do the lesson? Let's answer the man's question. So that's what they do for the Sabbath school class. They answer the question. At the end of the Sabbath school lesson, Bob and Mary stand up and go out and they say goodbye. Next Friday night, Mary says to Bob, Bob, I'd like to go to church again tomorrow. And Bob says, no, we went once. Look, I don't do church. No church, please, no. Mary says, Bob, was it so bad? Oh, it was all right. Did the guy, not, did the pastor not answer your question? Yeah, he answered the question. I have no objection. She says, and Bob, why can't we go? I don't like church. I don't do church. I'm a hell's angel. I don't do church. And she says, Bob, please, because you love me, let's go to church. Okay. So the next, that Sunday morning, they come to church. They sit in the front row again, and it goes from Sabbath school, etc. Go home. At the end of the next Friday night, the same thing happens. Mary pleads with them, go to church. Please, Bob, take me to church. All oh, right, said Bob. But listen, I'm getting tired of this church thing. Okay, so they go to church. Same thing happens. Front row, get through the Sabbath school lesson. They're going out. When the deacon says, it's been really great having you guys today, why don't you come to church? And Bob goes, we did come to church. He says, no, this is Sabbath school. Church starts in about 15 minutes' time. We would love you to come to church. And Bob goes, no, and they go home. Friday night. Mary says to Bob, Bob, why don't we try church today? Bob says, look, Mary. No, the answer is no. Bob, we haven't tried church. We went to Sabbath school, the deacon said. We haven't tried church. Let's go to church. Ah, it says Bob. So they get up again, still, all his angels are perfect. They go to church. They sit in the front row, and guess what the preacher or those or yeah, the preacher preaches on that Sabbath? He preaches on tithing. And the story said that Bob just climbs up to the whole service and his head is down and he's saying, I know what they want. They want my money. That's what church is about. So Friday night comes. Mary says, Bob, we go to church tomorrow. Bob says, no way, man. Didn't you hear the guy? That's what church is about. All they want is your money. They don't care about you. They just want your money. And, Bob, and Mary says, Bob, he didn't actually say it. I know he didn't say it, but, but that's what's behind it. No, Bob, this is what he said. He said, you enter into a trust relationship with God. And what God says, okay, you trust me with your income, some of your income, and I will look after you and bless you beyond what you gave me. Amen. Isn't that what he said? And Bob said, yeah, yeah, but that's not the reality. And she says, Bob... Why don't we try it? Why don't we do it the like I said and test it to see if God acts like this? And Bob goes, oh, 
just this once. So they come to church and they go to the front row and they sit down. And the deacon comes around for bringing the offering. Bob stands up in church and says, Listen, church, I'm tired of coming to church. I only come because she drags me along. But listen, last week, your preacher said, You give to God and He look after you. Is that what he said? Everyone who is here? Yeah, and he said, Yeah, that was right. So I'm putting in $15. Listen, if I don't get more than $15, listen, listen, you will not see me next week. And that's a promise. You got that? Puts the $15 in the plate and sits down. They go home. Next Friday night, Mary says, Bob, can we go to church tomorrow? Bob says, no. Says, Mary, Mary, I put, I wasted $15. Nothing changed. I didn't get any blessings. Nothing changed, Mary. It's a, it's, it's a con. It's just the way to get money out of you. And Mary says, no, just a minute. Let's, let's run through this. Let's play this through again. Mary says, what did the preacher say? So, well, he said, if you give your tithe. And she says, Bob, what is tithe? Yeah, he mentioned 10%. Is that right? Yeah, he said 10%. Did you give 10%? Oh, I didn't give 10%. He said, that's a waste of money. He said, I gave some money, not 10%. Then she said, Bob, listen, if you enter into a contract with someone and your deal is 10% and their deal is more than 10% and you don't do your part of the deal, why would you expect the other person to keep the contract? Bob, you got to keep the contract. And Bob goes, all right, I didn't give 10%. She says, why don't this week we go, tomorrow we go, and you give 10%. <sighs> it's a waste of money, Mary. But they go. Come into church. Bob's at the front. Plate comes around. Bob stands up. Says, okay, church, I know you see me here today, but it's not because God blessed me. Nothing happened this week. But Mary told me I didn't get 10%. percent i tell you, I am giving 10% this week. And I'm promising you, no way will you see me next week unless this $25 doesn't come back more to me during this week. So he puts the $25 in the plate, and sits down. The next Friday night, Bob says to Mary, we are going to church tomorrow. Amen. All right? Mary says, really? She says, we are going to church. This system works. Mm. And they're at church. They go to church. Bob sits down again. Plate comes down. Bob stands up. He says, church, is there anybody here who doesn't pay time? Mm. If you don't, you are stupid. Mm. This works. Last week, I put $25 in. And this week, my business just took off. I have never done so well in all of my work. Never. It was amazing. It works. Unless this week I am putting 35 in the plate. It works. You guys are going to be doing it. The following Sabbath, he's back again. And he says, Church, I tell you, if you didn't pay tithe last week, you've got it this week. Last week, my offering this week is 40s. It's just, it just keeps going. Third week, the same thing. And the third week, he's giving $40. And he's putting his money in the plate. He's the best preacher on tithing that the church has ever had. And he's putting his $40 in the plate. And somebody says, Bob, can I ask a question? And Bob says, yeah, last question. What's your business? And Bob says, I sell drugs. <laughs> and the pastor's there, and the pastor says, uh, Bob, do you mind if we have a little chat after this, after church? Bob says, yeah, have a chat. And that begins a series of Bible studies. A few weeks later on, the pastor stands up in Sabbath school. Bob and Mary are there, no longer in the Hells Angels kit. And the pastor says, this morning church is going to be completely different. Instead of Sabbath school, we're having a wedding service. Bob and Mary are being married today in church. And after that, we're not having a normal service, we're having a baptismal service. Because Bob and Mary are being baptized today. And by the way, there's no collection today, because there's going to be a bucket we're going to have a fellowship lunch. There's going to be a bucket. And I want all of you to give whatever you can into that bucket. Because Bob and Mary have broken their limbs with hell's angels. They've broken their limbs with drugs. And because of that, their lives are actually in danger. And I have agreed with a pastor of another Adventist church a long way away that they're going to move today. They've sold their bike, sold all that stuff. And they're moving to a new location. 
right away and establish a new life. And so the offering today is your gift to help them in their new life. Okay? But let me leave you with a question. Why would God, why would God bless the time of a drug dealer? Isn't God still in the business of meeting wild people where they are and bringing them into the fellowship of angels? Isn't he still doing the same thing? It's no different than Jesus. He met the prostitute where she was. He met the tax collector where he was. He meets the leper where he was and invites him into the presence of angels. That's our business. That's our task. To meet people, lost people, where they are, and bring them into the kingdom of heaven, into the fellowship of angels. May God help us to do that. Amen. 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 Amen.